Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel, Find a Way. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm so excited to talk about these uh, three case study films of uh, documentaries being shot during COVID. Um, first, thank you to the New Orleans Film Festival, Fallon, uh, Zandache, and um, Sergio for helping us put this together and for allowing the Documentary Producers um, Alliance Regional Committee to co-present this with you. Um, we're super excited to do this. I've been looking forward to this since we decided to do it. Um, first, let me start with uh, just saying why I wanted to do a panel like this. The purpose for me is to really um, demonstrate the resilience and the resourcefulness of the documentary producer. And in tonight's case, producers, directors, um, and how we always find a way. Um, so I've invited my incredibly talented colleagues, Sarah Archambault of Providence, Rhode Island, Andrew Hinton of Portland, Oregon, and myself, Shauna Brakefield. I'm in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. That's an actual, yes, that's in a city. Um, it's near, uh, we're, I'm just right outside of Chapel Hill. Our bios are in uh, the description of the event, so I won't um, bore you with all of our, our credits and things. But um, so I wanted to just dive right in, if that works for everybody. Um, I wanna talk about these three specific films for very um, good reason. Um, all three of these films have been shot during COVID or are currently being shot. Um, and as we all know, uh, we just don't get, I just felt like we didn't really, we don't really get a chance to talk like in deep detail about how people are pulling this off right now. So um, I'm gonna just dive in with Sarah's film first. Um, each one of our films are completely different. Our circumstances were different. Our subjects, our content, totally different. And um, I hope that you enjoy um, learning uh, about how we all pulled this off. So first, Sarah's film, which is an untitled um, Rhode Island elections film, <laughs> Um, Sarah is really known for telling stories about her community. This is, uh, her local stories are very passionate to her. And she had the foresight earlier this year to film behind the scenes of the 2020 voting operations of the state of Rhode Island um, and began following election process, the election process through the eyes of the people on the front lines. Incredibly timely, as we all know now. Um, so Sarah, I wanted to just have you um, talk briefly um, about this because when you first told me, this was in the thick of COVID when everything hit and everything was shutting down and we were all being told like, it's not safe to shoot or anything. And you told me, I I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm sending iPhones into this. Um, it was the peak of COVID. I remember this moment and you were gonna use iPhones um, give your subject cell phones and under your direction, have them film the behind the scenes of the election process. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that decision and how that process ended up playing out before we play your clip. Sure, I'm happy to, um, to talk about that. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, on this panel. Um, so I had the idea for the film in March or April. Um, right after the pandemic, we realized the pandemic was going to be quite serious and maybe a more lengthy than, um, than originally um, uh, hypothesized. And a really good friend of mine works on, uh, works for the Secretary of State for of Rhode Island. And so I talked to her about it. I talked to her about the idea of the fact that this is gonna be a kind of ridiculous thing to pull off that there was a, a global pandemic happening and it's pro we were about to enter what is now past us, um, one of the most challenging elections of our time, of, of my memory. Um, and so I was like, how are elections workers gonna be able to pull this off? 
And she's like, well, you know, I'm like, I, I, I was like, maybe we could do a film about this. And so she pitched to the Secretary of State and it was just crickets for a very long time because they have a lot that they're doing. So that my film was not the most important thing for them. Um, but I heard in July, many months later, that, hey, um, Secretary Gorbea is interested in you pursuing this film. Now, at this point, I had done no fundraising. Uh, I didn't think this was going to happen. I didn't think there was going to be a green light. And I didn't do any of the um, character development, like the casting and the relationship building, um, because I was really waiting for that crucial first access piece. But as you said, Shauna, we were in the middle of COVID. So our in a really kind of um, heightened moment in the pandemic. So we were like, okay, this can't happen. Well, first of all, I brought on a, a co-director and co-producer because I realized that we needed some scope here to be able to tell the story well, but that I couldn't take it on all myself because I'm also a mother to two children in who are gonna be, who are in virtual learning. Um, so I brought on a partner, my friend Margot Guernsey, who is my co-director, co-producer in this effort, and she had already made a political film in Rhode Island that was very well received and played on independent lens. Um, then we tried to talk to each other about what's the best way to, to get this access. How could we actually be in the moment? Because the only real way that we would be able to make this film is to be in the moment with these characters. So we sent in iPhones. Now we, we talked to, we went to all the seminars. There was a lot of seminars about how to make your films. There were seminars about how to make films on iPhones. And we actually um, did consultations with cinematographers about how to actually pull this off, what apps to use, what equipment to use. So we did all of this research and work. We then slowly cast the film and got at least three or four of our primary characters. And we bought each of them phones and, um, and got them going, got, did, did uh, workshops with them with our, our DP, all of this investment. And what we found out very quickly was that these people were way too busy to be filming themselves. There was too much happening um, in regards to the election and they were having to pivot and make decisions every single day. And the, and the impetus to like pick up the phone and start shooting was just too much and, and an additional layer that wasn't working for them. So what we had to do was make some really important and very difficult decisions about what spaces we would enter, if and when we would have crew in these spaces and why and have some really, um, important conversations about what our ethical compass was for this production. We kept the phones with these folks so that the, the phones became like diary reflections instead of actually shooting in the moment. And then we, we went on to a different kind of approach for Verite. And Verite is very hard in these situations because a lot of people did not want to be miked. Okay, so so it's it's fascinating and i i want to get like deeper into um all the ways you had to pivot because it's a like it's very fascinating how, all the decisions you made um can you we're going to show a clip of sarah's film right now that sergio is getting ready and before we show the clip can um if you can just give a brief setup of this clip you know it's your your gentleman because we talked about the sound Yes, I think that would be an interesting thing for our viewers to know about while they watch this clip. Okay, so um, in this, and this is a very rough sample that we've pulled together. So this is very early work. No one has seen it. I'm a little stressed about that. <laughs> um, but th this character, you're going to see, I believe, two characters in the clip that we've selected. But the first is Rob Rock, and he is the director of elections for the state of Rhode Island. You you'll see that he's not really wearing his mask um, in this clip. And you have to keep in mind that these folks have created like many of many folks are working from home. So these these offices are quite, um, some of them are empty, um, especially where you see people with no masks or they have created work pods. So they have made informed decisions about being maskless around each other, but I am the interloper who comes in with a full, like a shield and a mask, and I look like an alien in their spaces, and somehow they are able to act natural around my presence. Um, so I am shooting, and because we had some limitations with some, you know, again, some characters wanted to 
were okay being mic'd, um, some were not. Um, what we ended up doing was planting mics around the office. So we ended up planting these kind of lavaliers that were kind of hooked up on a wire and then directionally pointed to different places I knew the subjects would like to be. Uh, so we were running sound on the side. Again, this is one person, one person band because it's, it wasn't safe enough to bring other people in. So running sound and shooting um, while in these people's presence. And so it was a bit challenging. You'll also see a little bit of footage with people with masks and that's again, every single situation we did was a different set of COVID choices. Great. Thanks, Sergio, for running Sarah's clip. Bye-bye. People are, people are passionate, man, I tell you. These are mail ballot applications that have come back from voters with people who say, I wanna vote by mail and they fill them out correctly and they give them to us so that we can actually send them a ballot, 50,000 people. We've gotten you know, maybe a, a 100, 150 or so where people are um, basically saying that they are not gonna be voting by mail. Uh, like this one here, you know, no mail ballot, be American, go to the polls. I'm not sure what being American has to do with going to the polls as opposed to voting by mail. But um, I will vote at the polls, eat shit. That's a good one. That's a nice. And they have their names on them too, which is pretty cool. I will crawl before I mail in my vote, which is an interesting image. The end is near. Here's a good one. The end is near. Seek the truth while it may be found. It is written. So the end is near, according to Mr. O'Neill from Cranston. Not sure why people get so upset about uh, the mail ballots, but the reason why we do this is that people can have those opinions. We've got outlets here, we've got outlets back there. Mm -hmm. um, we do the DS200 would have to go roughly over where this table is right here. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have your supervisor tables right here, so the voters are going to come in. And then, so do we really need this many booths here? Hello? Oh, did they already deliver the equipment? Yeah, yeah, so just, um, so the booths go behind the supervisor tables. Okay, yeah. So I'm headed back to the office now because I have to go grab some stuff, bring it to the Secretary of State's office and shoot myself. <laughs> There's something about elections that you just, you grow to love and hate at the same time. <laughs> it's like managing a hundred weddings. Great, Sarah, that clip was awesome. Um, I hope you all thought that was as entertaining as I did. Um, we have lots of questions for Sarah uh, later in this panel, but I want to um, move on um, to Andrew Hinton's masterpiece, Cocoon. Um, <laughs> it really is. I saw this clip uh, or his, his film, which is 11 minutes, and it is the most moving, beautifully done, um, emotional, heartfelt, piece of filmmaking and it's mind blowing uh, the decisions he made to pull this off. So rather than um, talk too much about it before, although I'm gonna quickly give you the synopsis. So Cocoon um, documents the early months of the pandemic told through the perspective of students ages four to 17 living in their homes in Portland, Oregon. As students express their fears and their insecurities, they also share in this piece what they've come to appreciate and what they miss the most, their friends and the human connection. So let's roll Andrew's clip now. Thank you. and people can't see each other because then they might get germs on them. The air is contaminated. 
When I look out the window, I see no cars, no people. Lots of people are getting sick. And lots of people are dying. It's infectious, it's everywhere, and it's deadly. So the world is shut down to try to stop it. It gets in your, through like your mouth, eyes, and uh, nose, and it like attacks your lungs. It means not being able to breathe, your heart stops working, everything that helps your body function stops. That's why we have to stay in your in our houses and not go out. I think I don't really I think we call it quarantine, but I don't really know. It's been really stressful. You can't go to school anymore, which sucks. Most of the stores are closed. I haven't left the house, really. Um, I have barely left my room in over two months. Um, <laughs> That's not abnormal have, for you? No, I, okay. It's kind of like saying you're under house arrest, but you don't have like that like you don't have on that like collar that they put on in your leg to track where you are. Yeah, it kind of feels like a long time. It feels like five months. It feels like it's been going on for 133 years. I don't actually remember how long I've been quarantined. Um, I think I'm doing a pretty good job of actually knowing what day it is. Like, I'm pretty sure it's Wednesday. I'm not completely sure, but I think it's Wednesday. Uh, I've actually been thinking all day that it's that it's Thursday, but it turns out it's a Tuesday. It feels like time, like the day goes really slow. It's boring and I don't want to be in it anymore. And I want to see my friends. I wasn't kidding, right? That was incredible. Um, Andrew, so tell me what inspired you to make this? Um, where did you get the idea for this film? Sure, so I think as the pandemic started to take shape and take hold, I all my work dried up almost overnight. So all of the bookings that I had, suddenly it felt like production was closing down. And uh, I, I was rather forlornly putting away my camera and thinking, I've got to come up with something. You know, I've got to keep, I've got to keep making stuff. I've got to keep busy. And so I was trying to think about how I could do this safely, um, and putting a, a, a pane of glass between me and the and the people that I was filming seemed like a really, uh, a really safe thing to do. But I was also I was also really fascinated. Within the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, um, I heard from friends uh, who have kids how much their kids were suffering, and that wasn't something that I was hearing about on the news or reading about in the newspapers. And I just I just was fascinated by that by that idea that this wasn't a series of snow days. This was actually affecting kids' mental health. And, um, and that was a, that's a perspective that I wasn't, I wasn't hearing. So I thought, oh, there's something interesting here. So, so that's why I just started going out, initially just filming my friend's kids and then kind of spreading the net a bit wider. So that was one of my questions is, did you like knock on doors and ask parents like, hey, like who's this guy who wants to like film my kids? Who's this, who's this weirdo who wants to come and film from the <laughs> like, side? Just, there's so many kids in, in your film. I'm like, it, how did you get parents, like this, I guess the non front parents to agree to that? Yeah, I mean, obviously I had, to, I had to, to talk to all of the parents before I could film anyone. And oftentimes they were either in the room or in the next door room and, and listening into the conversation. And, and actually for them, I think it was quite revealing and, and they were sort of fascinated in, in the ways that their kids answered these questions because they hadn't heard their thoughts around a lot of these subjects. But 
Um, I reached out to a few people who are teachers, who are kind of community leaders, and uh, they were able to connect me with with their networks. So it's sort of it was word of mouth and and sending emails and making phone calls and and turning up and literally just pulling my camera and tripod out of the car, setting it up on the sidewalk and and ringing the phone and saying, okay, uh, you know. Tell me how you're feeling. <laughs> well, I want to come back to this, the uh, the whole audio thing, because it's it sounds so good. And I really want to ask um, you more about that in a minute. So yeah. it's just, it's such a beautiful job on this. I, I am blown away by this movie. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, uh, of course, my uh, fax machine, which never rings, like maybe twice a year, decided to ring right now. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about my film. Um, I, uh, I guess about nearly a year ago, um, approached Eric Jackson, who is a world renowned kayaker. Um, and we built a trust with each other and I decided, okay, this is, this is such an awesome story. Eric, Eric is a two-time Olympian four-time world champion. Um, he has, he's just a legend in the outdoor world and in the kayak world. And, um, and I just set out, I, he just is a force of life. He's, he's 57. He'll be 57 years old this year. And he's going to make a run at um, the Olympic team at 57 years old by the time he, the trials come, come back around. Um, uh, which we think, I think this will be his 28th year on the U.S. national team. Um, I'm st we're still trying to get the official statistic, but right now all research leads us to believe that this is a feat that perhaps no other athlete in history in any other sport has ever achieved. Um, on top of that, Eric is 70% deaf. Um, so um, when COVID hit, I was just getting ready to start filming. I was still raising money and I was trying to figure out how I was going to pull this, this off. But I knew I needed to probably shoot a few interviews and get a sizzle reel together. So, but here comes COVID. And I have to say, um, when everyone was saying, you know what, it's, we're just shut down and we really shouldn't be shooting at all. Um, there's no way to pull that off. I'm that person that goes, watch me. So I just, I just had to like prove that like this disease, this, this virus wasn't gonna like stop us from creating as artists. And something just got in me to like, okay. So I called Eric. Now, by the way, Eric Jackson lives in Tennessee. Um, he lives on a 20 acre um, uh, farm with the rest of his family members. So his mother-in-law has a, a house on the, on the property, his daughter and son-in-law, who are both world champions. His son lives in the main house with him. So they luckily, like all my main subjects in my family were all located in one location. Like they were all in the same space. Um, and so I, uh, these are all world-class athletes. Dane is the, probably the number one kayaker in the world. Nick beat Eric out of his fifth world championship, um, his son-in-law and his daughter, Emily, uh, is a like 11 time winner, like world champion. Like she's just crazy, like blows everybody away. So this is a, this is a, a legacy. Like this family is like the kayak family. So of course they're not going to want crew in their space. They're athletes. They can't afford to get sick. They don't, we didn't, at that time, we didn't know the long-term effects of anyone getting sick and what it was. Gonna, so they weren't going to risk anything. And they had an elderly um, you know, Christine, his wife's mother lives with them. So, um, so I set out to, um, film them. Okay. So here, I'm just gonna like try and get you oriented here. So Dane Jackson, who's like sponsored by Red Bull, who's like badass, like falls off like million feet waterfalls. He and Nick know their way around a camera. So that's like full disclosure. They kind of knew their way around a camera. They're on the road all the time. So their sponsors give them cameras to shoot, you know, in the jungles and all the places they go to. So they already kind of had it. 
But beyond that, they didn't have any experience whatsoever in, um, in lighting or doing audio. They were like run and gun shooters, but, but, but again, so they kind of knew their way around. They knew how to focus things. So I decided I wanted to put some money in the pockets of my crew. And I decided I was going to hire Dane and Nick to shoot all my interviews of the whole family, including themselves and each other. Um, I did standard work for hire agreements with Dane and Nick. Um, I, and I also hired my DP who is in Florida, my sound engineer, my sound recordist in Las Vegas. I was in North Carolina and my family was in Tennessee. And we did two weeks of Zoom prep calls where we um, basically uh, had them take photographs of all their equipment that they had in the house. It was like MacGyver, like, how are we gonna build this thing out? Tell me like your camera list and my DP and my sound guys would go over the list and we started ordering what they were missing and shipping it to the house. And we were doing location scouts room to room. So once we figured out what they were missing and where we were gonna set them up, we, we hired, like we did the FedEx delivery where they basically never had to leave the house. So FedEx arrived with the, with the gear um, and they also came and picked the gear up at the end. So they never had literally, none of us left our house for the shoot. Luckily we, so we had 4K cameras um, in the house and um, they were missing lighting and key, key um, audio equipment. Uh, and this was the first time I'd ever even thought to hot, like I never thought ethically, it was like weird, like hire your subject to like do, like this is weird. And I'm gonna talk later about the dynamic of that and the ethics of that and how weird that felt. Um, and what the dynamics for me were interviewing, interviewing my subjects who I was also mentoring and teaching and being trying to be mindful of not pushing them to a frustrating level of like not being able to figure out a tech issue they were just learning about because knowing they were going to be interviewed you know shortly thereafter themselves because we were like rotating chairs basically so i hope that kind of sets this my clip up a bit um but that's how i decided to pull this off what i'm about to show you here is, is a one minute very rough a roll string out of um, bites from all of my interviews. This is just um, this is just the main camera, not the B camera, which actually looks even prettier than this. Um, this was done 100% with me interviewing them via Zoom. My sound and DP were there present all on Zoom together, troubleshooting throughout the entire interview when things came up, answering questions. And this is the result. Um, again, this is raw. This is gonna, this is like the first string out of my my sizzle reel so go ahead sergio the best way that i can describe ej is that he's like the oldest kid i've ever met he's definitely a legend in his own right for sure my dad has done some of the most incredible things my dad was this 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 hero the jackson family everybody pretty much is a world champion when i get in the water everything that's happening on shore goes behind me when you're on the river in all these incredible places, there's just not a whole lot to distract you and there's not anything else you can think of except for what's in front of you. You're just so connected with nature. There's this raw beauty. Like staring down a waterfall, it's, it's just no, there's nothing like it. People always assume that I'm not nervous, but I'm actually incredibly nervous. I'm nervous every day on the water. No matter how scared I am, I always try to match it with Stoke. So EJ, often talks about this concept called life without compromise. You don't compromise. You don't compromise on anything that's important to you. Most kayakers get to 32 and they're like, you know what, I think I'm gonna slow down a little or whatever. Whereas my dad, he simply was like, I'm gonna kayak forever. It's not over, he's still going. He's in top shape and he's 55 years old. I wanna be the world's greatest competitive fisherman. I wanna make the US whitewater freestyle team 2021. I'm fit right now. You know, so I can go real fast. With a little bit of luck, I get to do both. Hi, welcome back. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, 
happy to answer more questions about that uh, a, a little bit later, but I want to go back to Sarah and um, just get a little bit deeper on, uh, and you were talking Sarah earlier about, um, you know, safety, um, technology preparation, the ethical decisions. Um, you've, we spoke previously about, you know, you and your co-director actually had like um, mission state, you describe it. Yeah, we, well, I mean, it was when we really, well, first of all, great job on your sample, Shauna, and thank you for sharing that work with us. It's incredible when you, when seeing it after hearing you describe how it actually had to come to be. Um, yeah, what, as Margo and I, I mean, I will tell you that this, you know, the, our production has been a learning process the entire time. And, um, you know, I feel like every producing challenge, and I don't know if you guys feel this way, but every producing challenge, you think that you've learned something and then you can go on and like, now you're going on with like this whole body of knowledge, but every single film I work on is a new set of problems that I feel like I'm learning something new from scratch every time. So it's just bringing your skill sets around um, research, creative decision-making, um, collaborative decision-making um, that, really help with the process in my in my estimation. But so Margo and I realized that we were we were bumping up against decisions that we've never had to make before in films, particularly with in regards to some of these ethical issues. And so we decided um, that and you know we were also very cognizant of the fact that we were listening to the conversations around the decolonization of documentary as well. And so you know, we wanted to make sure that our team was going to reflect, you know, the world in front of the lens. And we wanted to make some really important choices about how we were going forward in this work, both in regards to um, racial justice, but also in regards to health, public health. <laughs> so we decided to write um, essentially a value statement. We did some workshopping together on just like when we have to make decisions about when we're not sure what to do, let's always have this document that we go back to that says, okay, this is what we said we're about. This is what we say that we are about as creative makers in um, a dangerous time. Um, so we've, we've been able to use that as our guide, but I will tell you that we have every single day, every week, I am faced with new choices that I, I wasn't sure how to deal with. Um, and this, and having set these guidelines out for ourselves at the beginning was incredibly helpful. So just one, I have another question about this. So, um, because you, you could tell like your clips that, you know, like, let's get into the mask wearing. So you, we were, you were protecting yourself and your crew when you, when you did, when you felt okay to bring crew into certain situations. Um, but your subjects were like hit and miss in terms of like mask wearing. So how, um, tell me an example of walking into a situation where you had to like pivot in the moment and make, and like instantaneously make a decision. Cause this is, these aren't things that you got warned about going into the shoot, right? Yeah. And I think, well, you know, and I, I don't want to like position my subjects as if they're like willy nilly about masks. They have made decisions about their safety as like work compatriots and how they because some of these folks i don't i don't know how they could do their jobs with masks on all the time they are behind mm -hmm. for, for many of them they are behind plexi they wear masks when, when they are outside of the plexi um with the public um but when they are in their work units sometimes they are not wearing masks um and so you know i was like as i mentioned before i was the invader into their safe space and so the discussions I had to ha I had to have very frank discussions with them about what is your what's your um, you know what what are your um, your own guidelines and and barriers for safety where where do you feel like what's your line um, are you okay with me coming into this space are you okay with me and another filmmaker coming into this space. Um, or not? Are you okay wearing a microphone? Are you not okay wearing a microphone? I came up with a testing regimen. We each came up with testing regimen so that we were getting tested regularly um, in order to be, be able to inform them our status. Um, 
so there was a there were a number of conversations. It, it was all about transparency. The whole thing was about transparency. Um, and that was true for my crew as well. Like there were certain situations, for example, like just realizing deeply that these folks were they were comfortable with me being there. They were gonna work, you know, they they were fine with me, but no one else. And, you know, in this sound situation, Shauna, that I was describing earlier, but they were like, we don't want to wear lavaliers. Now, some of these folks are moving all over the place. <laughs> and um, the only way I would be able to capture sound in a traditional documentary would be laving everyone. But this, but they did not want to be touched in that way, which, or even be close to that kind of contact. Completely understandable. So I brought, a sound person in, not to be in there to mic, to, to like actively um, mic, but to create the sound design and plan for me. Mm. And so those were the situations where I'm like, okay, I see the problem. I know we need to come up with a solution. Um, it, you know, for example, shooting in cars, we, we, we used a bunch of GoPros because no one could be in the cars and yet so much activity is happening as these folks zoom from polling location to polling location. Um, so those, those kind of specific examples, I would love for people to hear of like, th these are like the problem solving. This is the problem solving producer skill set right here, people. <laughs> I mean, so if, think about more specifics like that. I'm going to ask Andrew, um, I want to I want to come back to that because you had so many awesome like pivot MacGyver moments where you just had to like okay we're gonna do it this way <laughs> like right now um Andrew I what I'm really curious to hear more about um from you is how you built a trust so quickly with these children they seem to just be a hundred percent comfortable I, I'm curious how how you worked through that and how did you get them to be so vulnerable and honest and open and and well this is these are kids but tell me more about that trust and how you did that well i'm i'm interested to hear you both talking about how you kind of figured out the technical challenges and uh in terms of trust so my i, I did a sort of test shoot and the test shoot was with a friend of mine who's a sound recordist who happens to have a 12 year old daughter so um i kind of killed two birds with one stone because he was able to help me figure out which cables i needed in order to plug my phone directly into my camera and also his daughter was somebody that I know already. And so we could have a, a pretty, you know, sort of frank conversation. And I mean, I suppose that's that's why we do what we do is, is going into a situation and meeting people you don't know, dealing with a subject you know very little about and just being genuine and being curious and asking questions in a way that is meaningful to the person that's that's being asked and um i found that kids very quickly well i, I guess every everybody'd been kind of stuck at home and and was a little bit starved of human contact by the time i, I guess i was filming mainly in april and um I, I looking back on it now i need to put a, a time stamp because it is very much as somebody said in the comments um the early COVID period, early COVID period. I mean, it's interesting how you can tell that um, through their, through, through what they say and, and how things have sort of evolved since then. But um, I mean, in terms of building trust, I read a, I read a, um, a, an interview with um, Albert Maisels in which he said that he could establish trust within 20 seconds, just through a glance of, you know, through making eye contact with his subject and that, and that he could communicate, listen, you know, I come in peace, basically. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to get something out of you. I'm, I'm genuinely here with an open heart to, to hear about your experience. And I mean, obviously editing is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so, you know, we, we can exercise our, our power in the edit suite to make it, you know, to choose the most intimate moments and the the sort of most unguarded moments. But overall, I would say, you know, I found the kids incredibly open and, and willing to talk and 
you know, in a sense, this was therapy. I do feel like as filmmakers, we're kind of therapists somehow at some times, not always, obviously, but, but this was an opportunity to really express what they were going through. And, and so I, it, it's not that I had to like, you know, do a song and dance or do any, pull out any tricks to do it. It was just a question of, um, of uh, getting off on the right foot, striking the right tone and um, using the Albert Maisel's Jedi eye contact trick somehow. Well, it definitely <laughs> seemed to work. Um, what surprised you the most during the making of this? I think I think I was really surprised by how much people, well, kids were missing school. I I, I look back at my own time at school, and I I think that if I if somebody told me schools cancelled for the next six months, I would have been so happy. Um, but but without fail, the kids were really struggling and and that was partly missing their friends and their social interactions partly missing the routine people talked about the the school bell being this kind of way of navigating their day and um the school bus you know all these elements where um it gave order and structure to their lives and that had been kind of pulled away and so i i was really surprised by the way that and, and and a lot of them were like I miss my teachers and that was surprising to me I know Sarah your your husband's a teacher so um I'm sure he's a wonderful teacher but I I I was really shocked by how much the kids really love their teachers and love going to school and love their friends and you know it it, it was just so sad to me that all of that was taken away and 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 that screens were such a poor substitute, you know, that, that it was such a struggle to figure out how to do it. You know, no, there, there's no sort of standardized way of doing it. So it just seemed a bit of a mess and, and the kids were kind of, yeah, just struggling. So I, I was really surprised by that. I thought it would be like, yay, we don't have to go to school, but actually, you know, school is so much more than sitting in a classroom learning stuff. It, it's, it's such a, it, you know, it's a social experience. It's a, an intellectual experience. It's, you know, it's sort of everything in their, in their lives. And, and uh, so, yeah, that was surprising. Well, I think all of us who are parents have, have watched this evolve now over several months. I have a senior in, in high school who's yet not gone to her classroom yet as a, in her senior year. And it's pretty, it's heartbreaking. Um, but you've you've uh, told their story so beautifully, um, Sarah. What surprised you uh, during like what what shifted your viewpoint as a filmmaker? I mean, what what was like the whoa moment? Like I didn't see that coming. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think from a just from a personal perspective i'm i am one of the you know small percentage of people who are a little obsessed with politics i'm very much a political watcher um and um i didn't realize how infinitely calming it was to have this massive distraction <laughs> where other people are like doom scrolling um election news <laughs> every day, I was actually getting to, I was bearing witness to what these folks built to make it safe and secure for everyone. Um, I, I feel like I shouldn't be surprised by this, but there was something about bearing witness to it that also just solidified for me the absolute integrity of the people who do this work how much they care about it, how much the people who are involved in elections are not actually political actors, but they deeply care about the right to vote. They don't care who wins. Like one of one of my favorite moments, um, because my film covers um, both a primary and uh, the general election. On primary night, uh, the head of elections for the city of Cranston, where one of the locations I was filming, it was like 11 o'clock at night and he was just, everyone's running around, bags are coming in, they're trying to account for these ballots, et cetera, et cetera. And he just looks at it and he goes, who won? And it, it, was, it was, and no one knew, <laughs> people didn't, like it wasn't what was important to them. What was important that was that was how they did it. 
And um, that's what makes the current conversation in the country right now, from my perspective, so difficult to bear is because I actually, from what I saw, and I know that these people know their colleagues in other states, that, um, that these folks really do care about what they do and do it with deep integrity. And I'm, I'm hoping the film shows just even a little bit of that. Well, especially as of these, the recent days, I think we all are gonna be really looking forward to this, your movie. It's like, yeah, I think it'll be very well attended. Um, so I think we should just move into some of these questions that are popping up uh, and leave plenty of time for question and answering, if that's okay. Uh, I'm gonna just randomly pick some in no particular order, but um, there's a great question here. Are there any skills you picked up? This is for both of you. Uh, any skills you picked up from having to shoot under COVID that you'll carry with you once it's gone? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to feel that because I'm a producer who is now a first time director and first time shooter and apparently first time sound collector. <laughs> so uh, I, I've had to, even though I've, I, being a producer, you have to have familiarity with all of those roles and the demands of all of those jobs, but to do them all at once was something that I've never had to do before. And I definitely am not a big fan of me holding a camera. Um, those, the, there are people who are deeply gifted in that department and I'm happy to hand it back over. Um, but I, I would say that what I was excited to learn was just about myself was that I could do it and I could figure it out. And um, I'm a little bit of a technophobe. And so it was like having to throw me in the deep end and learning how to swim. But I am, I'm excited about what we've been able to collect. And uh, I do hope to bring at least, at least that gumption, if not some of the skills into some of my future filmmaking. Nice, Andrew. So I, I would say that in terms of filmmaking, w one of the interesting developments for me, as I, as I said, the, all my work just stopped at the beginning of the pandemic, everything kind of ground to a halt. And I've found in the last couple of months that there's been a kind of gradual uptick in, in work and particularly remote interviews. So um, I've had a lot of, uh, freelance gigs recently where companies, particularly in the UK, which is obviously where I'm from, who need to do a, a, an interview with a contributor um, will get in touch and I will go and, you know, wear a mask and so on and set up an interview and then dial in a director or a series producer remotely who will conduct the interview. And so I'm learning to like things. <laughs> <laughs> I hate lighting stuff. I, I, as a documentary maker, I like sort of, you know, I like, I like making the most of what's there. Um, so for me, lighting is artificial. Um, so I'm, I'm really learning how to light, which is kind of interesting and is giving me a new appreciation of light. Um, so in, in terms of filmmaking skills, that's something. In terms of life skills, I think, um, I've been doing a lot more parenting. I have a two-year-old. I've been doing a lot more parenting in this period than I would otherwise have done. And that's been incredibly rewarding and exhausting as any parent will know. Um, so I'm sort of taking forward a deeper connection to my son and a greater appreciation for how to light an interview. Wow, yeah, we can all relate to that, I think. Having our kids and, and husbands at home working all together day after day. No, just kidding. My husband's upstairs watching this right now. <laughs> Hi, <Annie. laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to take another question here. Um, let's see. This, so someone said, what a beautiful capsule of the early COVID period. Great clip earlier. Um, the sound was great too. Are there moments? you were nervous about in terms of shooting, how did you respond to them? Uh, Sarah. Yeah, I, I have um, 
I have maybe two things I could talk about there. One was um, early voting was, and we call it emergency voting here in Rhode Island and there's legislative research uh, reasons for that. But it, it, in essence, it's early voting. It was incredibly popular here um, where I live and um, it was a new, it was brand new. Um, and so the lines were incredibly, there were lines and there was even with six foot distance in indoor spaces, um, there was, there was crowding. Um, and in addition to that, um, I do live in New England. So during the course of this film, we had all of the weather. So mm. like deadly heat, like rain, snow, it snowed. Um, and so that also like those weather conditions also kind of forced people closer together than they would be. So I would say that the moments I was nervous was were kind of around those conditions and having to choose to continue filming um, or not. But I, I did make choices to continue filming even when I was feeling um, like the situation I was seeing was not 100% within the boundaries of where I was feeling comfortable. And then I think the other, the other moments were, um, and this is probably something that other filmmakers have had experience about, but just, you know that like really important things are happening here and you're seeing people um, whisper to each other and <laughs> you're trying to figure out like who you should be following and what is, um, yeah, I, I think part, part of it was just like, given the significance of the vote, wanting to, wanting to be really responsible about people's privacy around their vote, at the same time trying to um, bear an accurate witness to what people were going through. Does that make any sense? Oh, and no, trying to weigh, weigh those moments um, or trying to weigh those decisions, um, which are both creative and ethical in the moment was a stress that was new to me. And I would say those moments made me a bit, a bit nervous. What, you know, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Something come to mind for you. And then I have a comment too. I, I was, I, I would say that there was nothing in the actual shooting that made me nervous because we were so well separated. Um, you know, once once the once the sort of device of okay, I'm going to be outside, you're going to be inside, um, was established. I wasn't nervous shooting. I so I I didn't get release forms signed, which I know is sacrilege in the in the world of documentary and probably very a, a very sort of naive thing to do. But I've always felt that I want the people that I film to be comfortable with how they're represented. And so I partly, because I didn't want to have any contact with anyone, you know, I didn't want to sort of push a piece of paper through a mailbox or whatever. I know you can do it electronically now, but, but even so, um, I didn't want to sort of introduce that to the process. So I was more nervous when I sent a link to the film <laughs> to all the parents and, uh, and sort of sought their blessing to say, you know, you know, I sort of emailed and was like, okay, here's, here's the film. How, you know, are you okay with it? And, and that was, that was a bit nerve wracking because um, they could easily have turned around and said, no, you know, this is, this is, I don't like the way you've portrayed my, my child, but fortunately nobody said that. Um, but I, for me, the, the experience of shooting, because, because I had somehow managed to re reduce or remove the threat of, mm -hmm contamination, um, if that's the right word. I, for me, it was a joy, you know, it, it, it was kind of an opportunity to keep doing what I love doing. And, and so, you know, I jump in the car and go to the location and, and it was a really fun experience for me and hopefully for the kid. And, and just to go back to what you, you asked earlier, Shauna, about them feeling relaxed. I think it was partly because they were in their own homes as well. Mm. You know, they, they weren't sitting in a studio in a weird environment, they were in their own home. So um, I think that contributed to a really nice sort of exchange. Yeah, totally. I, I'll just chime in on my film. What, what terrified me the most 
<laughs> and it was less about exposure than it was about the dine. I just felt like I couldn't screw up. Um, you know, doing interviews, first of all, long distance through Zoom is, is oh, you have to work. I felt like I had to really, really rise to the occasion on really getting that that communication in through two computer screens and then into the lap of my subject. Like that was that was really challenging. I was exhausted at the end of those days. Um, but was really unnerving for me was a couple of layers. One is I've never hired a subject. I like had a formal contract where they actually were getting paid to film. And so then I had the, the whole, like, what if this goes wrong? What if they have a problem with the contract? What if I'm not offering them enough money? Like these are, these are subjects that I, I intend to have a long relationship with maybe over a two year period of filming them. I'm at the beginning of this project, not the end. So I had to like, speed date the trust there, um, you know, entered into this, you know, sort of sterile contractual thing to get us going because I wanted them to feel like their time and efforts were, were going to be compensated. So it was important to me. Um, and then when we got into prepping for the film um, and all the technical coaching and we did PDFs and we, my sound, oh my God, my sound guy, Michael Carmona, man, he's like the rock star sound <laughs> designer and, and um, Greg Carrick, who was my DP on this, coached them so patiently, long distance through every single, like literally crack open your gears. We're going to go over it together. This is what this is. I mean, they were so patient and so great. But I was nervous that we were gonna, they were gonna get frustrated with something or they were gonna get worn out by the technical aspect. Um, and not only selfishly did I think it was going to maybe in, um, you know, how do I say, like inhibit the, the interview process. They were gonna maybe not come to their interview fully themselves as if I had like beautifully lit them. They just walked in and did their interview and walked out, but they'd been working all day shooting their parent, you know, everyone else. That made me really nervous that I was going to tax them in a way that I've never had my subjects taxed before. Um, and that it was going, to, I didn't, I just felt like God, am I going to like, if they're going to be an upset and is this upset going to like last the duration of a two-year movie? So I had, I felt like the stakes were really high on so many levels. Um, and, and also I, I, uh, I mean, luckily these are athletes and they're used to tough situations and they're really freaking gritty and they rose to every occasion, like I was just blown away at their grit and how they stuck through something. And, um, but okay. Last comment on this for me was, and the, probably the most complicated dynamic of my film was this was a family that were all, all going to essentially be interviewing themselves, um, in very emotionally charged moments. So you had, you know, my main subject, um, Eric Jackson and his son-in-law behind the, the camera and his son, and he's breaking down very emotionally in tears. And I really had to like explain to the guys ahead of time, please create a safe space for whomever is on the other side of this camera. Don't move, don't fidget, no matter how uncomfortable you feel. You're right now, you're the sound guy. And right now you're the camera guy and, and let them cry, let them, there was only one moment where I asked an uncomfortable question that made Dane more uncomfortable than my subject. Um, and he tried to stop the interview. <laughs> Actually, he did stop the interview. But aside from that, um, that was really the, 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 to me, the most emotional dynamic at play. It was like, okay, how are they going to handle each other? Are are they going to feel safe to say everything in front of the other person? And they did. They did a beautiful job. They all opened up. They all got heartfelt. They all were emotional. 
And I just kudos to Dane Jackson and Nick uh, to Proutman for just, anyway, doing such a great job. Okay. This, this is more of the therapy that Andrew was talking about. We're just, all of these films are like. I know, there are therapy <laughs> sessions. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I will say that I'm really fascinated to hear about the technical setup that you had, Shauna, because I, I watched, I did watch Totally Under Control, the um, the Alex Gibney film, and he'd, he'd obviously, he and his co-directors had created a package of some kind that they mailed or FedEx to contributors that, I mean, they, they I guess they talked them through remotely how to do it. Um, and then there are scenes in the film where there's a, a more conventional interview set up where there's a camera person, but there's, a, there's all sorts of screens in front of, between the camera and the contributor. So it's interesting that, that different filmmakers are finding different ways to, to kind of get around this, this idea that we can't be, you know, in close proximity with our contributors for, for long periods of time. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I love hearing all these stories because I just like, oh, I'm gonna try that. Like, oh, that's right. Um, I have a question that came in for Andrew. It says, Andrew, you mentioned connecting your phone to your camera. I have the same question. I saw the kids holding their phones, an image I loved. Can you talk about the audio setup? I couldn't possibly reveal my secrets. That's, uh, no, uh, basically, I think I mentioned that my first, um, my first kid that I filmed was the daughter of a sound recordist friend of mine. So we, we, I, I went over there with all the cables that I had and he pulled out the essential piece, which cost like 15 bucks from Best Buy or something. So it was a little, a little thing that went into an iPhone and came out as a mini jack. And then I had a mini jack cable that went to an XLR. So it's iPhone to mini jack to XLR, basically. And if anyone steals that idea, I need credit. <laughs> I'm gonna use it. <laughs> well, I, I will say I will say that the audio I'm I mean, gonna start calling it a Hinton. <laughs> I will, I will say that the audio, the audio quality on phone calls is not amazing. I mean, I found that on, on WhatsApp, for example, it was better. It seemed to be clearer. I mean, I, I, look, I, I did a lot of research beforehand and I was like, are there, re are there sort of remote recording services that I could use that I would then try and sync up? And, um, and this was the simplest, most elegant solution. And it, 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 it definitely, it worked really well. Um, so I, I've got an idea to try and um, show the film in a, in a public setting where it's projected onto the window of a shop or a gallery or something downtown. And in, in my mind, people can go to the window, see that there's a projection, hold up their phone, it links to a QR code, which takes you to the audio, and then you can listen to the film on your phone. So the idea is that that it, it feels a little bit like a two-way, well, I guess it's a one-way conversation, but the idea of people listening to the film on their phone while they're watching it projected on a, on a window or a, you know, a wall or something really appeals to me. And that audio kind of makes sense. Um, but but yeah, I, I I'm not sure that I'm not sure that from a point of view of um, a cinema documentary or whatever, it would pass muster exactly. Yeah, I think Andrew, that's a really I think it's an interesting point that you make in that there's something about the conditions of of production during COVID that that gives you some allowances for the you know. What the lack of polish in some in some areas, or essentially like there is a production a COVID um, aesthetic to to some degree that you can bring into your film, um, particularly films like yours and mine that that actually address the pandemic itself. Right. I mean, I guess it's slightly more challenging in Shauna's case where she's not she she's the pandemic is sort of invisible in your film, isn't it, Shauna? At least at least for now. That was the intention. I did not want a COVID stamped movie because I don't know, I just, 
it was really a challenge for myself. How can I make it look that way? And yours will be evergreen too. I mean, it has nothing to do. It has, I mean, so far has nothing to do with uh, the pandemic. So, I mean, I think you're pulling it off, Shauna. It's incredible what you've been able to do so far. It's, it's a really interesting question though, because, you know, we obviously as filmmakers, we putting people in masks on screen immediately kind of dates or, or kind of places a time and a timestamp on it. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that kind of balance of wanting your subject to be not necessarily wearing a mask, because then you can see the whole face and you can kind of, you know, have the full experience um, versus, is it safe to do that? And um, are you putting yourself or your crew or whoever at risk by doing that is, I think a really interesting challenge that we face. Well, and I, I'm putting this question to you guys because it's one I have not figured out yet. To subtitle or to not subtitle? <laughs> because, I mean, there are many, many scenes that I have with like, like crucial um, dramatic or contextual scenes where everyone's in masks. The sound is okay. It's not as great as I would love it to be. I'm definitely going to be working with an amazing sound designer to help me with this. Um, but when people, I mean, do, do we use subtitles with masks? I think you have to, if you can't hear it. What about ADR? Why didn't you just, why didn't you just hire I've some been thinking that? about ADR, Andrew Hinton. I've been mouth. thinking about that. <laughs> because I th I'm like, I'm almost more partial to that. Um, but it, it would really need to be given that it's a verite film it would I need know. to be woven in so finely um to really okay. land and to really work but that gets expensive I, I i would say that because your film is is sort of immersed in this time that it's completely Forgiven. legitimate to have yeah to have subtitles and i and i think almost enhances the mm -hmm. you know it, it sort of draws people's attention to the fact that, that it was challenging to film. And I, for me, that's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm told that Americans don't like reading subtitles. So I, I, uh, I, I reserve judgment, but I, I, I think it's, I think it's a good idea. I appreciate you guys workshopping this problem with me <laughs> <laughs> in front of the New Orleans Film Festival audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions from those watching or any questions from you guys to each other? Well, I'm um, I'm curious, Andrew, on, on um, the distribution for this film, because the other problem that we're all kind of pushed up against is a distribution challenge. Um, so, how have you been getting this out, and um, and then uh, what you're working on now? Oh boy! So I, I've always been quite proactive in terms of getting my work seen and out into the world. I've, I've sort of managed to um, push it out there. I understand that as filmmakers, we're not just making the work, we're kind of promoting the work and trying to get it seen. And, and it's really interesting. I found this particular project, which I really love, and I feel very, um, ha you know, I'm delighted with, the, with how it turned out. Um, it's been a real challenge to get it, uh, to find the right platform. So it was also interesting to realize that, that the number of, of online platforms for short documentaries is actually quite limited. There's like maybe six or seven. And so there are six or seven people plus their assistants who kind of manage that, you know, manage what, what gets onto those platforms. And I kind of, I've just ended up drawing a blank on most of them. I do have one that has expressed an interest. They said it was too nice for their platform. And could I do a part two, which was that, which sort of went into the weirdness and, and sort of sci-fi-ness of it a bit more. And so mm -hmm. I think because we're now entering lockdown 2.0 or whatever you want to call it, um, I am 
I am tempted to get back out there and either film the kids or talking of kids. Have you got one? Yeah, there you go. You've got one coming in. Mine has just <laughs> arrived too. Um, either film the kids and sort of catch up with them in a sort of seven up kind of style or go back and film the parents six months later or film completely different um, people, adults probably who, uh, so, so, so it, it sort of has a part two six months later, which I think could be interesting. I mean, it's been fascinating for me how the meaning and the interpretation and the way that the film is watched has changed over time. I mean, there was, a, there was a period where there was a lot of controversy around school reopening. And there was a feeling from a couple of people that I sent it to that it had become such a political issue. And, and there was a sense within the film that it's bad to leave kids at home, that, that it then seemed to promote a particular political viewpoint, which obviously wasn't my intention at all. So it's been interesting how it's, how its interpretation has sort of evolved. Um, so, uh, yeah, what I'm working on now, I guess, is about to be part two of Cocoon. Cocoon to the return, um, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it might be called. Um, and, we'll, and we'll see. I, I, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I, think, I think it could be interesting to go back to those kids and see how they've managed the last six months of their lives. That would be amazing, actually. And Sarah's part two will be recount? No. I might. Well, we just we just filmed the recount, actually. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, there was a recount here, and now we're we're about to film the uh, risk limiting audit, which is the audit of the election results here, and then we'll be filming the electors um, voting on December fourteenth, and possibly some. Um, some other wrap up in, in each of our locations, but uh, the election's still being counted, you guys. It's even when the announcements are done and the fanfare is over, these folks have a ton of work to do. And so we're still following them. Thank you both so much for doing this tonight. Um, I learned I learned a bunch. Has someone just put something in the chat? No? Okay. Um, I learned so much just from your films. I know there is a lot of creative filmmaking happening out there. And I hope this um, panel tonight helped shed some light or inspired all of you to get innovative. There's, uh, we all know now that it's not one size fits all. Um, innovate in your own spaces, pivot in your own spaces. We know you can make things go right and be safe, obviously, and be ethical and be good producers and filmmakers, but um, just, you know, find a way. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for including us. <laughs>